Rogue Wave, a short story by Theodore Taylor. A killer wave, known to mariners as a rogue wave, was approaching a desolate area of Baja, California, below Ensenada. It had been born off the east coast of Australia during a violent storm. It had traveled almost 7,000 miles at a speed of 20.83 miles an hour. Driven by an unusual pattern of easterly winds, it was a little over 800 feet in length and measured about 48 feet from the bottom of its trough to its crest. On its passage across the Pacific, it had already killed 13 people, mostly fishermen in small boats, but also an entire French family of five aboard a 48-foot schooner. Melissa Scoot Atkins went below into the old sea dog's tiny galley, moving down the three steps of the companionway, closing the two solid entry doors behind her, always a good idea in offshore sailing. The three horizontal hatchboards that were on top of the doors were also firmly in place, securing the 30-foot baba type against sudden invasion of seawater. Rogues and sneakers have been around since the beginning of the oceans, and the earliest sea literature makes note of giant waves. The U.S. Navy manual, Practical Methods for Observing and Forecasting Ocean Waves, says, In any wave system, after a long enough time, an exceptional high one will occur. These monstrous outsized waves are improbable, but still possible, and the exact time of occurrence can never be predicted. Naval hydrography studies indicate that waves 15 to 25 feet high qualify for sneaker or sleeper status. The freak rogue is up to 100 feet or over. As waters slowly warm, they seem to be occurring more frequently. In 1995, the Queen Elizabeth II, or the QE2, the Great British Passenger Liner, encountered a 95-foot rogue south of Newfoundland. More than 900 feet long, the QE2 rode over it, but her captain said it looked like they were sailing into the white cliffs of Dover. Sullivan Atkins, Scoot's oldest brother, was steering the cutter-rigged boat on a northerly course about 15 miles off desolate Cabo Colnet, south of Ensenada. Under a brilliant sun, the glittering blue Pacific rose and fell in long, slick swells, a cold light breeze holding steady. Below deck, Scoot was listening to Big Sandy and his Flyright boys doing Swing and West and singing along with them while slicing leftover steak from last night's meal. They'd grilled it on a small charcoal ring that was mounted outboard on the starboard side at the stern, trailing sparks into the water. The sea dog had every blessed thing, including a barbecue pit, she marveled. Scoot was learning how to be a deep water sailor. She was 14 years old and pretty, with dark hair. Though small in size, not even five feet, she was strong. She'd started off with eight-foot sabots. On this trip, her first aboard the Sea Dog, she'd manned the wheel for most of the three days they'd been underway. She'd stood four-hour watches at night. Sully was a good teacher. It was one of those perfect days to be out, Sully thought. The three Dacron sails belayed and whispering, white bow waves singing pleasant songs as the fiberglass hull, tilting to starboard, sliced through the ocean. It was a day filled with goodness, peace, and beauty. They'd come south as far as Cabo Colnet, turning back north only an hour ago. They'd sailed from Catalina Island's Avalon Harbor, the Sea Dog's home port, out in the channel off Los Angeles. Sully had borrowed the boat from a family friend, Bo Tucker, a stockbroker with enough money to outfit it and maintain it properly. Built by Tashing of Taiwan, she was heavy and sturdy, with a teakwood deck and handsome teakwood interior, and the latest in navigation equipment. Sully had sailed her at least a dozen times. He'd been around boats, motor and sail, for many of his 19 years. He thought the old Sea Dog was the best in her category that he'd ever piloted. 
As he was about to complete a northeast tack, Sully's attention was drawn to a squadron of seagulls diving on small fish about a hundred yards off the port bow, and he did not see the giant wave that had crept up silently behind the sea dog. But a split second before it lifted the boat like a carpenter's chip, he sensed something behind him and glanced backward toward the towering wall of shining water. It was already too late to shout a warning to Scoot so she could escape from the cabin, too late to do anything except hang on to the wheel with both hands, too late even to pray. He did manage a yell as the sea dog became vertical. She rose up the surface of the wall, stern first, and then pitch-pulled violently, end over end, the bow submerging and the boat going upside down, taking Sully and Scoot with it, the forty-foot mast, sails intact, now pointing toward the bottom. Scoot was hurled upward, legs and arms flying, her head striking the after-galley bulkhead and then the companionway steps and the interior deck, which was now the ceiling. She instantly blacked out. Everything loose in the cabin was scattered around what had been the overhead. Water was pouring in and was soon lapping at Scoot's chin. It was coming from a four-inch porthole that had not been dogged securely and a few other smaller points of entry. Sully's feet were caught under four-stay sailcloth, plastered around his face, but then he managed to shove clear and swim upward, breaking water. He looked at the mound of upside-down hull, bottom to the sky, unable to believe that the fine, sturdy sea dog had been flipped like a cork, perhaps trapping Scoot inside. Treading water, trying to collect his thoughts, he yelled, Scoot! But there was no answer. Heart pounding, unable to see over the mound of the hull, he circled it, thinking she might have been thrown clear, but there was no sign of her. He swam back to the point of cabin entry, took several deep breaths, and dove. He felt along the hatchboards and then opened his eyes briefly to see that the doors were still closed. She was still inside. Maneuvering his body, he pulled on the handles. The doors were jammed, and he returned to the surface for air. He knew by the way the boat had already settled that there was water inside her. Under usual circumstances, the hull being upright, there would be four feet nine inches of hull below the waterline. There would be about the same to the cabin overhead, enabling a six-foot person to walk about down there. Panting, blowing, Sully figured there was at least a three-foot air pocket holding the sea dog on the surface, and if Scoot hadn't been knocked unconscious and drowned, she could live for quite a while in the dark chamber. How long? He didn't know.